Viewers, welcome to Senior Teleclass on Tech TV. And today, we are still doing our introduction to chemistry. We are in the third lesson. We are going to discuss symbols and formulae. And our learning objectives, by the end of the lesson, you would be able to identify symbols for different elements. Secondly, you will be able to write correct symbols and formulae for chemical substances. And thirdly, you will be able to determine the atomicity of substances. And what are symbols? A symbol is a short term form of writing the name of an element. And how do we write symbols for elements? We use the initial letter or the initial letter and one other letter in the English or Latin names of elements they are used. And always the first letter is capital, but the other letters are small letters. Let's look at, for example, if I have these substances, carbon, chlorine, cobalt, chromium, cerium, cesium. You see, all these elements begin with capital C or letter C. So if you are representing C for these elements, there will be confusion. And we use C for carbon. When we look at chromium and chlorine, we have two. The first two letters are the same. So if you have to represent them by CH, it will be a problem. And so we have CL for chlorine, CR for chromium. And the same applies to other. So either we use the first letter or the first letter and one other letter. Now, whenever we are using the first letter, it is always capital. But if we are using other letter in addition, the second letter that we are representing should be a smaller letter. Sometimes some people write chlorine as CL. It is wrong because the second letter should not be a capital letter. And if you also write C, L like this, and C is small, it is also wrong. The C should be capital and the L should be small. So let us look at examples of these symbols. If you look at the element and its symbol, we have hydrogen which is represented by H. We have oxygen represented by O. We have carbon represented by C, as I mentioned. We have phosphorus represented by P. We have nitrogen N. And we have boron B. We have sulfur S. All these elements, you see that they are represented by single Letters and they are all the initial letters of their names, English names. There are others which we represent by two letters. Let's look at examples of such elements. We have aluminium represented by AL. You see that A is capital, but the L is small. Then we also have magnesium. Where we have M and G, we are not using M and A, we are using M and G. And you know, as usual, G is small, M is capital. We have chlorine, C, L. And C is capital, but the L is small. We have radon, which is R, N. We have cesium, C, S. We have calcium, which is C, A. So these are the substances whose English name are being used. If you take substance like copper, and we have the name English name copper, we 
don't use C, we don't use CO neither, but we use CU. But if you look at the English name, you see that there is no U in the name of copper. But how do we obtain the CU? Let's look at examples of such. We have the English name sodium, for example. The Latin name is natrium. And you see the symbol is Na, where we are taking it from the Latin name, the first two letters. We have another element, potassium, from calium being the Latin name. You are using the first letter K. We have silver, argentum. We are using AG. We have gold, aurum. We are using AU. We have iron, ferrum. We are using FE. And we have lead, plumbum. We are using PB. We have copper. As I mentioned, the name is cuprum from the Latin. And we are using the CU. We have mercury, there is no H in the English name, but we have hydrogerum. So the name, the symbol is obtained from. So as we mentioned, symbols are obtained from the first letter or the first letter and one other letter, either from the English name or from the Latin name of the element. Students, let's move to formally. How do we obtain uh, formally, or what is formally at all? When we talk about formally, chemical formally, because we are dealing with chemical substances. When we talk about chemical formally, we use it to identify compounds. Every compound has a formula representing it, or a formula representing it. And chemical formally, they show the kind and the number of atoms that are present in the compound. And when we are writing formally, we combine elements and we take into consideration the combining capacity of the various elements. And this combining capacity, we call it as valency. If you see valencies, that is the combining capacity of the elements. And so we want to look at how do we write formally for compounds. When we are giving sodium chloride, let's see. We have Na plus and Cl minus. The Na is sodium. Cl is chlorine. Na has combining capacity of 1 plus 1. Cl has combining capacity of minus 1. But when we are to write a formula or formula for sodium chloride, sodium will bring 1 and chlorine will also bring 1. And then because of neutrality, we interchange the combining capacities so that sodium will take 1, chlorine will take 1. But because we don't write 1,1, one, one, we write a formula for sodium chloride as NaCl. And that is the formula for sodium chloride. So you see that the N is capital, the A is small. C is capital, L is small. If I write it like NaCl, it is wrong because you see that the C is very small, but the C we in the first letter for the symbol for chlorine should be capital. So that is how we write a formula for sodium uh, chloride. Let's take aluminum combining with oxygen. We have aluminum bringing plus three, oxygen minus two. So the combining capacity of aluminum is three. And the combining capacity of oxygen is two. So when we have these two atoms or these two elements combining, then we interchange the uh, combining capacities. So the aluminum will take two and the oxygen will take three. So that is formula for aluminum oxide. So you see that 
the compound is neutral because aluminum with a charge of plus three, we have two giving us plus six, and oxygen with a charge of minus two, we have three giving us minus six. So plus six minus six gives us a neutral atom or the charge zero. So the formula for aluminum oxide is Al2O3. So let's look at other examples. We have magnesium combining with chlorine. Magnesium has a charge of plus two, chlorine a charge of minus one. So the combining capacity of magnesium is two. The combining capacity, which is the valency of chlorine, is one. Now when we interchange them, you see that the magnesium would take one and the chlorine would take two. But because we don't write the one, we have the formula for magnesium chloride as MgCl2. So whenever magnesium combines with chlorine, we have the formula as MgCl2. And the compound is neutral because magnesium, we have one charge of plus two. Chlorine, we have two. Each one has minus one. So the total of minus two plus two minus two will give us zero. Now let's look at a formula formed between magnesium two plus and oxygen two minus. And again, the combining capacity of magnesium is two. Combining capacity of oxygen is two. So when we interchange them, we have Mg2O2. But two is common. And so as one one, they cancel out. So that the formula for magnesium oxide is MgO, not Mg2O2. So if you see sodium chloride, it is NaCl, magnesium chloride is MgO. You think that they have the same charges? No. Because of plus 2 and minus 2, so we are having a neutral uh, compound. And that is how we write formally for this. Let's look at other examples. Let's take this time group of atoms, SO4, 2 minus. The SO4, 2 minus, the whole species has a charge of minus 2, and sodium has a charge of plus 1. So the combining capacity of sodium, as usual, is 1, and the combining capacity of the group SO4 is 2. Now, when we interchange, the combining capacities of the two species. We have sodium taking the two, and the whole SO4 will take one. But because we don't write the one, we remove the bracket, and then we write Na2SO4 as Na2SO4 as the formula or formula for sodium tetraoxysulfate 6. I mentioned sodium tetraoxysulfate 6. When we come to nomenclature naming of compound, you understand why it is sodium tetraoxysulfate 6. Let's take aluminum combining with sulfate. Aluminum is coming with plus 3, so the combining capacity of aluminum is 3. And combining capacity of the sulfate is 2. So this time when we interchange, aluminum will have the 2 and SO4, 2 minus will have the 3. So you see that this time I'm not removing the bracket because 3 and 2 are not the same. So when we meet compound like this, we will know the charge or the combining capacity of each of the species that join together to form the compound. And that is the formula for aluminum tetraoxysulfate 6. And so, let's go to other species and see. When we have calcium 2 plus and 
sulfate or tetrosulfate 6, 2 minus. We see that calcium has a charge of plus 2. Tetrosulfate 6 has a charge of minus 2. So the combining capacity of calcium is 2. Combining capacity of SO4 is also 2. When we interchange, we have calcium taking the 2 and the group also taking 2. And you see that 2 and 2, they are common. So this time we remove the bracket and we have the formula CaSO4. And that gives us the formula for calcium tetra oxo sulfate 6. And so that is the how we write formally for compounds. So students, you have seen when the charges are 1, 1, or 1 and 2, 2 and 1, for elements 2 and 3, then when you have a group of atoms, we combine the whole group, combining with a certain number. So when we see that the numbers are the same, we remove. But when it is also one, we remove. But if it is not one, as we saw for aluminum, tetos of a six, aluminum with three, sulfate with two, we don't remove the charge from it. Let's look at another substances. This time, both ions are group of atoms, not single atoms as we saw. So we are going to look at such species, when we have NH4 with a charge of plus 1, NO3 with a charge of minus 1, then the whole group NH4 is coming with 1, NO3 is also coming with 1. When we interchange their combining capacities, we have NH4 with a charge of 1 combining, NO3 also 1. And we see 1, 1. So we remove the bracket and to obtain the final formula for ammonium trioxonitrate 5 as NH4 and O3. So because of 1, 1, we have removed the bracket from the two species that combine. Now let's look at another group of atoms combining. And we see that NH4 plus is combining with CO3 2 minus. As usual, NH4 plus will bring a charge of 1. So their combining capacity is 1. CO3 2 minus, the combining capacity is 2. When we interchange their combining capacities, we see that NH4 will take 2 and CO3 would take one, but we don't write the one. So we remove the bracket from CO3 and we obtain the formula NH4 to CO3. So that gives us the formula for ammonium trioxocarbonate 4 or ammonium carbonate. So that is how we write formally for compounds. So anytime we are given ions to write formally, we have to consider the charges, which will be the combining capacities of the substances or the species. And when they combine, if we see that it is one, we don't write the one, we remove the bracket. If it is not one, we maintain it. So we are going to look at some so that you try your hands on them for us. So let's, now when we combine these elements or these species, we have something we call atomicity. When we talk about atomicity, what do we mean? It tells us the number of atoms that join together to form the compound or the substance or the species. So let's look at uh, the atomicity as we define it. We said the number of atoms present in one molecule of a substance is called atomicity. Let's take 
example, hydrogen gas. It denotes we have the formula as H2. The 2 is representing the number of hydrogen atoms. So H2 denotes a molecule of hydrogen gas, and it contains two atoms of hydrogen. Let's take another substance, H2SO4, which is tetrahydrosulfate 6 acid or sulfuric acid. This one we have two, we have four. What are they representing? This H2SO4 denotes a molecule of sulfuric acid or tetrahydrosulfate 6 acid. It contains two hydrogen atoms, so we see H2 there. It contains one sulfur atom, so there is no number attached to the sulfur. And it contains four oxygen atoms, so we see four there. That is what we call as atomicity. So when you are given any substance, and then you are asked to give us the atomicity, I believe or I hope you'll be able to give us the atomicity. So let's look at the examples. We have the noble gases, or the inert gases, or the rare gases. They are names. Why do we have noble? We have rare. We have inert. Noble, we know that when somebody is noble, he's the person who does not want to uh, mingle himself or herself with others. So these substances don't want to combine with others. And rare, they are not common. We don't see them. They are inactive, so we say they are inert. So the three names uh, reflect them. And we see that helium, neon, argon, krypton, zonum. Though all of them have two letters, but there is no number attached. So what do we say? We say that these elements, they have atomicity of one. So we say that they are monoatomic species. The atomicity is one, so we say they are, they are mono atomic species. Let's look at another example. When a molecule contains two atoms, we say the element or the molecule has atomicity of two, or it is a diatomic species. Many we say they are diatomic species. Let's look at examples. If you take H2, hydrogen gas, we see the two there. If you take N2, we have two. O2, we have two. Let's take NOACL, NACL, CO. Unlike the first three, which are two, 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 we have NO. N is one, O is one, though we don't write. So the two will give us two. So the atomicity of that substance is two. The same applies to ACL. The same applies to NACL and CO. So such compounds, we say they are di atomic species. We have another one which have atomicity of three. And such species are termed as triatomic species. So when they are made up of three atoms, we say they are triatomic species. Example, let's take ozone. We see O3, O3. That means three oxygen atoms. If you take CO2, we have one carbon atom, you have two oxygen atoms. One plus two will give us three. We have carbon one, oxygen we have two. If you come to water, H2O, we have hydrogen, two atoms, but oxygen is one. So two plus one gives us three. Let's take sodium hydroxide. This time we have three different elements. We have Na representing sodium, we have O representing oxygen, we have H representing hydrogen. Each one we have one atom, one atom, one atom. So one plus one plus one, three. And it is triatomic species. So it is not just one element. Ozone is one element, oxygen. But CO2, H2O, they are made up of two elements. But one is one, the other is two. When we take NaOH, made up of three elements, one, 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 so it is a tri 
atomic substance. So when we have to give triatomic species, either we give a single element with three atoms or two elements, one is two, one is one, or we give three, one uh, substance which contains three elements, one, 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 that is triatomic. We take the fourth example where we have four atoms and the atomicity of that element compound or substance is four. When we say it is tetraatomic species. Let's take example NH3. We have one nitrogen atom and we have three hydrogen atoms. So one plus three will give us four. The same applies to SO3. We have one sulfur, three oxygen. But when we take phosphorus, we have four atoms of phosphorus. And that atomicity of the phosphorus is four. So such species are termed as tetraatomic species. Generally, any substance that contains many atoms, we can call it as polyatomic species. Whether the, it is two, whether it is four, it is five, ten. Let's look at example, zinc sulfate or zinc tetrazosulfate six. You see that we have one zinc atom, we have one sulfur atom, we have four. And if you look at we have six of them. So we can say it is a polyatomic species. Let's take magnesium sulfate heptahydrate. We have the magnesium, the sulfur, the oxygen. Even there, we have six atoms. Then we come to the water. We have seven affecting the water. Phosphorus, P4, NH3, all these have many atoms, and we call them as polyatomic species. So, students, we have seen how we write formally for substances and how we classify them. We said if it contains one atom, it is monoatomic or atomicity is one. If it contains two, atomicity is two or diatomic species. If it contains three, it is triatomic, four, tetraatomic. And don't forget, di, tri, tetra, it can be one element, it can be two, it can be three, it can be even four. So depending on the number of atoms, present, we call it as atomicity. So let's look at this question. And then I'll give you some, uh, just one minute to give me the answer. And the question one is write formally for compound form from the following species. I, we have PB2 plus and O2 minus. I, I, Fe3 plus and SO4 two minus. I, 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 Cu2 plus and OH minus, IV, Na plus and HCO3 minus. So you take, it's supposed to be HCO3, so put the three there, Let's put the three there so that you can give me the formula. So it will be Na plus and HCO3 minus. So that is for the IV. So let's, uh -huh. so I'm giving you one minute to give me the answer. I hope you are trying to get correct answers. When I come to check, I expect you to score uh, four out of four because we are taking time going through. I believe you have finished. So let's look at the answers that you provided and mark it yourself. So you see, I, we have PBO. If we go, we see that PB2 plus O2 minus 2, 2, and therefore we don't write, so we have PB. If you see I, I, Fe was plus 3, SO4 minus 2. So you see that when you interchange, you obtain Fe2 into bracket SO4, 3 minus. If you look at the 3, 
we have Cu into bracket OH minus. If you go back, you see that Cu has a charge of plus 2, OH minus 1. So when you interchange, you get the correct answer, which is Cu, OH. And IV, we have Na with a plus HCO3 with that. So when you put into bracket, because of 1, 1, you obtain, you see that we have Na plus HCO3 minus. When you interchange, you have one one, and that gives you. So I hope that you have done your answer correctly. So let us look at another question. Mention one element which is, so I want you to write one element which is monoatomic, II diatomic, I don't forget, I say element. I did not mention compound. So hurry up to give me the answer. Just, you are just mentioned the formula or the element. Mention the element. So mark it yourself. We have helium, neon, argon, and so on. They all have monoatomic or they are monoatomic. The second one, we see O2, H2, Cl2, they are diatomic elements. And then we have phosphorus, which is P4 tetra atomic. So I hope you have also scored three on three. So let's write this assignment when we go home. We try, so next time when we come, we show what you have done for me. Write formally for compounds or compounds form from the following species. We have Pb2 plus O2 minus. Then we have Fe3 plus OH, NH4 plus and SO4. These are group of atoms. Then we have V5 plus and O2 minus, Mg2 plus and IO4 minus. I hope you will do justice to them. And next time when we meet, we will start. We have talked about two things, symbols and then formally of compounds. And you know how symbols are represented, and you know how formally are written, and you know the atomicity of substances. These are things that we have discussed. And so go home, go and study, go through, and then do the assignment. When we come, we will look through. Bye-bye.
Viewers, welcome to Senior Teleclass on Tech TV. And today, we are going to discuss the last part of Introduction to Chemistry. My name, as usual, Thomas Asarebodu. And we are looking at chemical equations today. Last meeting, we discussed about symbols and formulae. And we saw what symbols are. And then we saw how to write formulae for various compounds. And we did examples. I hope you were able to do the assignment without any struggle because we looked at various examples. Some were even part of the work that we did. And I hope you don't have any problem. We are going to discuss chemical equations today. By the end of the lesson, I expect that you should be able to what is meant by chemical equation or what chemical equation means. Secondly, you will know how to balance chemical equations. And thirdly, you will be able to write ionic equation for chemical equations. And lastly, you identify some types of chemical reactions. So let's look at what is chemical equation. When we talk about chemical equation, it means the shortened form or manner of representing chemical reactions. You know, when reaction, okay, instead of writing this react with that and that and that and that, we can represent it by some symbols and formulae, and that will show the chemical reaction. So what is, that is what we mean by chemical equation, shortened form of representing chemical reactions. Now, the substances that are reacting, we call them reactants. So students repeat them after me, reactants. And those that are being formed, we call them products. And as usual, repeat it, it is product. This product is not as much teacher will come and tell you, let's find the product of two and three, no. This time, it is the substances that are being formed. It's what we call as product. Now, the direction of the reaction is always indicated by an arrow from the reactant side to or towards the product. And therefore, the reactants will always be on the left-hand side of the arrow, and the product will be on the right-hand side of the arrow. So let's take example sodium chloride reacting with silver nitrate to form silver chloride and sodium nitrate. We see that sodium chloride and silver nitrates are on the left-hand side of the arrow, so they form the reactants. And silver chloride and sodium nitrate are on the right-hand side of the arrow, they form the products. The sodium chloride and reactants, as I said, now, what is the meaning of the plus sign on the reactant side? It means react with. And the plus sign on the product side means end. And the arrow indicates or means yields or produces or forms. So if you go back to the reaction, we can read sodium chloride reacts with silver nitrate to form or to produce or to yield silver chloride and sodium nitrate. So when you see equations, I hope you can read equations. Now, anytime we write chemical equation, the physical states of the species involved in the chemical reaction are often indicated using the symbols. Whenever we see G, it means that the substance is a gas or it is in the gaseous state. If you see L, the substance is a liquid or it is in the liquid state. If you see S, the substance is solid or some say crystal. If you see AQ, it is aqueous, that is solution prepared using water as the solvent. So let's look at this example. We have sodium being solid, water being liquid, 
hydrogen being gas, and then sodium hydroxide being aqueous. Then we have equations, which all the reactants, all the substances, whether reactants, products, are in the same physical state. We call that equation as homogeneous equation. And homogeneous equation, let's look at example. If you take N2, it is in the gaseous state. H2 is in the gaseous state. And A3 is also in the gaseous state. So this is an example of homogeneous equation. If you take the second equation where we have methanol in the liquid, ethanoic acid also in the liquid, forming methyl ethanoid in the liquid, water in the liquid. The physical states of all these substances are the same. So these are examples of homogeneous reactions. Then when we have equations where we have different physical states, we call the equation as heterogeneous equation. In heterogeneous equation, we have different. So if we take this equation, we have aluminum being solid, hydrochloric acid being in the aqueous state, hydrogen being gas, aluminum chloride aqueous. So we see different physical states there. Then we say that it is heterogeneous. Let's take another equation. Silver nitrate is aqueous, sodium chloride aqueous. But when we come to the product side, silver chloride is solid, and then sodium nitrate is aqueous. Though the three are aqueous, one is solid. So it is an example of heterogeneous equation. So we have seen homogeneous and heterogeneous equations. Now, how do we balance chemical equations? What do we mean when we say chemical equation is balanced? Whenever we talk about balancing of chemical equation, we have to make sure that the same number of each kind of atom of the elements on the reactant side are on the product side. Uh, let me repeat it. We say when we talk about balancing of chemical equation, it means making sure that the same number of each kind of atoms of elements on the reactant side are on the product side. So when we are given equation and we see that the number of each kind of atoms are not the same, the equation is not a balanced equation. Now, what steps do we follow when we want to balance chemical equation? We have to check whether the reaction is possible or not. If the reaction is not possible, it will be difficult to balance it. The second step is that we write down the correct formula and symbols for each of the species involved. Don't forget, when we discuss the symbols, I told you sodium chloride, uh, chlorine. The first C is capital, but L is not capital, it is small. So don't forget that. Then the third one, we write down the unbalanced or skeleton equation leaving some spaces in front of the species in order to fix appropriate numbers later. We don't change the formula. We write down the total number of different atoms on each side of the equation. Then we try to check whether they are the same. If the atoms are not equal, then we fix suitable numbers in front of species containing the elements or the element that we are to balance. Not that we balance it inside. No, in front of the species containing the element. And you should know that you should not change the formula or symbol of any species in the process. So let's look at example. When we are to write chemical equation for a reaction between hydrogen sulfide and sulfur 4 oxide, which is SO2, to yield water, H2O, and sulfur S. So we know this reaction is possible, and how do we go about it? Now, we have to write the skeleton equation. 
the skeleton equation, we have hydrogen sulfide, which is H2S, reacting with sulfur dioxide, SO2, to form water, H2O, and sulfur. Now, when we write the element, we see that on the left-hand side, we have hydrogen 2. Right, we have hydrogen 2. Then we have sulfur 2. But on the product side, we have sulfur 1. When we look at oxygen, we have 2, we have 1. So the hydrogen, we say it is balanced, but the sulfur and oxygen are not balanced. And if you look at the equation, you see sulfur stands alone. So it will be appropriate that we balance the oxygen before we come to the sulfur. And how do we balance the oxygen? So when we are trying to balance the oxygen, we put two in front of the H2O, where we have one atom of oxygen. So when we put two in front of H2O, this time we look at the atoms. On the left hand side we have hydrogen two atoms, product side we have hydrogen four because of the two that we put there. The two is affecting both hydrogen and oxygen, so that gives us four. Then we have sulfur, still two, and right hand side we have one. Then the oxygen is now balanced, so we have balanced the oxygen. And as we balance the oxygen, we have uh, change the number of hydrogen atoms. So we will balance the hydrogen atom. The hydrogen, we have two here, and we have four. So we are going to balance the hydrogen atom. And as we balance the hydrogen atom, we put two in front of the H2S, which is on the reactant side. So when we put two in front of H2S, we have the number of hydrogen atoms on the left-hand side, which is four, the number of hydrogen atoms on the right-hand side, four. Then the sulfur, because of the two that we have put in front of H2S, it has affected the sulfur in the hydrogen sulfide. It has become two plus the one in SO2. So sulfur is now three. But on the right hand side, we have one. And oxygen, we have two, two. So we are left with sulfur, which is not balanced. And then we are going to put three in front of the sulfur atom on the product side. So when we put three in front of sulfur atom on the product side, this time let's look at the various atoms. We see that hydrogen is now four because of two in front of H2S and we have two atoms. So when we multiply two by two, that gives us four. And the same applies to water, two by two, four. Then we have the sulfur, we have two from H2S, we have one from SO2, that gives us three. And then we have three in the product side, giving us three. Then we have the oxygen, we have two from the SO2, and then we have two from H2. So we see that the number of atoms of each kind, uh, each kind of atom on the product side are the same as on the reactant side. Then we say that the equation is balanced. So we have our equation which is balanced. That is how we balance the equation. Now, when we study different amount of elements which combine to give compounds or different compounds, amounts of compounds that react to give new substances, we call it as stoichiometry. So students, it is not difficult to mention stoichiometry. For example, let's take sodium chloride. So one atom, as we did for the formula, we have N, A being one, C, L being one. So this is a stoichiometric formula for sodium chloride. So if I write Na2Cl or NaCl2, that those compounds are not stoichiometric compounds because when we combine Na plus and Cl minus, it will not give us Na2Cl or NaCl. So when we say that, we studied a different amount of elements which combine to give compounds 
or we look at the balance equation that we saw, we could see that we have two moles of H2S and then one mole of SO2 giving us two moles of H2O and three moles of S. We could see that th we have the same number of each kind of atom. So that gave us a stoichiometric equation. So I hope you, you know how to balance the equation. Now, we come to ionic equation. When we talk about ionic equation, what do we mean? We are referring to any chemical equation which contains at least one ionic species, either as a reactant or as a product, and such is an ionic equation. So let's look at this example where we have H plus equals plus OH minus equals forming H2O liquid. It is a typical example of ionic equation. Now, whenever a chemical equation occurs, it is aqueous substances, but not solid, not liquid, not gas, separate into constituent ions. When, when they separate, every ion or each ion behave as an individual chemical substance. And during that reaction, some of the ions do not take part in the overall reaction. We call such substances as spectator ions. Students, I hope you have witnessed games being played on a field. Let's take football, for example. When we go to the football field, we have 11 players on the field. And we have a lot of people around. All the people are there. We have some which are taking active part in the game. Though the referees and linesmen are there, but they don't play. It is the 11 from each side which play. They are the actual players. All the others around, whether you are giving commentary or you are just watching, you are a spectator there. In the same way when chemical reactions okay. Not all the ions will take part in the overall reaction, and we call them as spectator ions. And how do we identify spectator ions in chemical reactions? Spectator ions are ions that exist in the same form in the equation. And so let's look at example. When we talk about spectator ions, they are ions that exist in the same form in both the reactants and the product side of the equation. The spectator ions, they exist in the same form in both the reactants and product side of the equation. So, let's look at example now. Let's take example one. Silver nitrate reacting with sodium chloride to form silver chloride and sodium nitrate. You could see that silver nitrate is in aqueous form. Sodium chloride is in aqueous form. Silver chloride is solid. Sodium nitrate is aqueous form. And we said all the aqueous substances will dissociate. So we see that in forming AgNO3, it was Ag plus reacted with NO3 minus. They are all in the aqueous state. Then in forming sodium chloride, Na plus combined with Cl minus. In forming silver chloride, because of the solid state, we have maintained it. We have not broken that compound. But sodium nitrate is aqueous, and we have broken it. We have Na plus aqueous and NO3. So if you look at the equation, we could see that the Na plus and NO3 minus, look at Na plus and NO3 minus. If you go to the reactant side, we see that both Na plus equals NO3 
minus A cross are also found in the product side. They are the same. So we say that Na plus and NO3 are spectator ions. So don't forget, I said spectator ions remains the same form in both the reactant and the product side. So that the ionic equation is Ag plus equals plus Cl minus to form AgCl. So you see that the actual reaction occurred between the silver plus ion and chloride minus ion to form the silver chloride. So that is example. Let's look at another example. When we have ion solid reacting with sulfuric acid H2SO4 equals to form hydrogen gas and then ion sulfate. Now the ion is in the solid state. The sulfuric acid is in the aqueous state and hydrogen is in the gaseous state. Ferrous sulfate is aqueous. So let's see what happens. Because ion is solid, it remains the same. Now H2S, don't forget we are not writing H2 plus, but we have written 2H plus because when the H2SO4 was formed, it was H plus and SO4 2 minus. So we had H plus, not H2 subscript plus. And so when we are writing ionic form, we should be able to write the correct species. So we have 2H plus and then SO4 2 minus equals forming H2 gas and Fe2 plus then SO4. And we could see that the SO4 is the only ion that exists in the same form. So this time we have only one ion which is a spectator ion. Though we have Fe Fe. But don't forget on the reactant side, no, there is no charge and it is in the solid state. The product side, it's supposed to be aqueous. So Fe2 plus aqueous plus SO4. This should have been the equation. So that the ion, we can't say it is a spectator ion because they are not in the same form. Don't forget I said they should be in the same form. Then the H, you see that the reactant side we have 2H plus. The product side we have H2 gas. They are also not in the same form. And so don't confuse when we talk about spectator ions. And that will give us the final equation, which is Fe solid plus 2H plus equals forming H2 gas plus Fe2 plus equals. Those, so that gives a ionic equation for the equation above. Let's look at the third example that we have. We have the third example. It is sodium hydroxide equals plus zinc chloride equals forming zinc hydroxide solid and sodium chloride equals. This time you see that there is two in front of sodium hydroxide, unlike H2SO4. And the two is affecting both Na plus and OH minus. So we have two NH, Na plus and two OH minus. But when we come to zinc chloride, we have ZN2 plus and two of them forming. So you see that the zinc hydroxide is solid and we did not break it. And we didn't break it because it is in the solid state. And if you look at these, we could identify the spectator ions. So we could see that Na plus and Na plus, they are the same. And then we have two Cl minus and we have two Cl minus also in the same form. So the spectator ions are the sodium 2 plus, 2 Na plus, 
and 2Cl minus, giving us the ionic equation 2OH minus plus Zn2 plus forming ZnOH2 solid. So that is the ionic equation for the entire equation. So when we are asked to write ionic equation for any equation, don't forget we said the aqueous substances break into the constituent ions, but not solid, not liquid, not gas. They remain the same, and that is that. Now we have type of chemical equations. What are some of these types of chemical equations? Let's see. A chemical equation, we recognize them by the phenomenon that is accompanying them. We have different types of chemical reactions. We cannot exhaust them, but we will look at some of them. As time goes on, when we take various topics, we will meet a lot of them. So one, we can divide them into various classes and each of them. Let's take a combination reaction from the name, combination, combine. When we have two substances or more substances coming together, combining to form a single new substance. We call that reaction as a combination reaction. Let's take ion, combine it with sulfur to form ion sulfur. We could see that ion and sulfur combine, they are two, to form a single compound. Let's take lead Four oxide combined with sulfur, four oxide to form lead at all surface six. Two of the substances combine to form a single one, and we call it as a combination reaction. Let's look at the third one. We have calcium oxide combined with carbon dioxide to form. So, all these compounds or reactions, we see that different substances combine together to form a single substance. We call it combination reaction. We have decomposition reaction. This reaction, a compound breaks to its constituent species. And normally it is accompanied by applying heat. And we call it as thermal decomposition, where thermal represents heat. So thermal decomposition. When we take calcium carbonate and we heat it will break to give us calcium oxide and carbon dioxide, which is a decomposition. So this compound will break to give us this, and that is a decomposition. When we take potassium chloride and we heat, potassium chloride will break to give us calcium chloride and oxygen gas. That is also a decomposition, which is thermal. If you have water and we heat, it will give us the hydrogen and then the oxygen. So these reactions are thermal decomposition reactions. And let's look at other reactions. Double decomposition. If you look at decomposition and double, you think that it is breaking two times. No. Double decomposition has another name we call ion exchange. And it is a reaction where two compounds break and they exchange their ions. The cation of one will take the anion of the other. Generally, when we have a reaction like this, A, B plus C, D, you see that the product A will take the D to form the A will take the D to form AD. A is the cation in the AB and D is the anion. Then the C, which is the cation in one, would take the anion B to form CB. So this reaction is called ion exchange reaction. And ion exchange reaction, the other name is double decomposition. Almost all reactions are double decomposition reaction. Let's take example, copper sulfate reacting with hydrogen sulfide. You see that the copper is taking the sulfur 
and then the hydrogen is taking the sulfate. So the product we are copper sulfide and sulfuric acid. So that is a double decomposition reaction or ion exchange reaction. We have silver nitrate combining with sodium chloride. And the same applies. The silver is taking the chloride and the sodium is taking the nitrate to form silver chloride and that. So we have that. Then we have displacement or substitution reaction or replacement. Three other names. Either we di one displaces the other or one is substituted or one is replacing. They are all the same. And there are reactions in which one element or group of elements takes the place of another element or group of elements in a compound. So let's take example, if you have zinc reacting with copper sulfate, we have the zinc taking the place of the copper to form zinc sulfate and copper alone is forming. So that is a displacement. We can say that zinc has displaced copper or zinc replaces copper or copper is substituted for zinc. So that is, we have potassium bromide combining with chlorine and you could see the product where chlorine is displacing the bromine from potassium to form potassium chloride and then the bromine. So these are examples of reactions. Then we have neutralization reaction. When we talk about neutralization reaction, it is a double decomposition reaction in which an acid reacts with a base to form salt and water only as the product. So when we take sodium hydroxide ACL, we could see that sodium is combining with the chlorine and hydrogen is combining with the hydroxide to form sodium chloride, which is the salt and water, which is there. So we could see that sodium chloride is the base and hydrogen chloride or hydrochloric acid is the acid. Then sodium chloride is the salt and water is formed. That is. So we have several reactions that we can meet later. And some we have the oxidation reduction reaction, which we call as the redox. Then we have hydrolysis, acidification, catalysis, and many other reactions that we will meet later. So we have discussed chemical equations. And then how do we balance chemical equations? And so we are going to balance this simple uh, equation. So take time to balance the two equations. And yes. Okay, let's see what you have done. The second one, you are writing ionic equation for the following. So hurry up to write and then give me the answers. The answers we have, you see calcium remains the same, but chlorine is two and what, so when we have calcium oxide solid, plus 2NH4Cl to form calcium chloride plus 2NH3 plus H2O liquid. Mm, no. So you see that the calcium is 1, calcium is 1, if you come to oxygen, we have one, one. If you take nitrogen, we have two, we have two. If you take hydrogen, we have eight. We have six here, we have two from the water. And if you take chlorine, we have two, we have two. So that equation is balanced. I hope you were able to obtain it. Let's look at the answer for the second one, we have Na2CO3, then if you put two in front of HCl, two, 
2 in front of NaCl, then H2O liquid, CO2 gas. You could see that Na, we have 2 here, we have 2, because 2 is in front. Then we have C, we have C. Then we have 3 oxygen here, we have 1 oxygen, we have 2, giving us 3. Then we have two of the hydrogen atoms. We have two from the water. We have two Cl. Then we have two NaCl. So that gives us the balance equation for the second one. Yes. So the ionic equation, when you go home, I expect that you work. So that next meeting, we are going to look at the answers that are needed for this. Today, we hope we have discussed chemical equation. And you know the meaning of chemical equation. You know how to balance chemical equation. You know how to write ionic equation for a chemical reaction. Don't forget, we said we break aqueous, not solid, not liquid, not gas. And then we identify spectator ions which exist in the same form in both the reactants and the product side. Then we have looked at different types of reactions. And so for next time when we meet, we will discuss new topic. So this brings us to an end of the introduction to chemistry. We will meet again to discuss other things in SHS1 chemistry. Bye-bye.